Okay, welcome back. It's Monday. Whew, Monday. It's Think Tech Talks on a Monday. It's the <laughs> SOWEST Hour. And if you didn't know by now, I'm going to tell you again. It's the School of Ocean and Earth Science and Technology at UH Manoa. And actually, we have it in the studio, in the gallery. She's <laughs> out there. Talia Ogliori. She is in the Office of the Vice Chancellor for Research. And we are delighted to have her here. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> okay, but our guest today, Baruth Gates, who is an ocean science researcher at SOWEST, and Madeline Van Oppen, who is from Australia and who is a collaborator, I mean that in the nicest possible way, <laughs> of Ruth Gates, and they're working on science projects together. And today we're going to talk about assisted evolution to help coral adaptation to ocean acidification. I'll say it again. Assisted evolution means you can evolve things by, I mean, by willfully, by, by, by choice, by science, um, to help uh, coral adaptation, and coral apparently adapts. I'm just setting the stage for you guys. Mm -hmm. um, and coral adapts to ocean acidification, which is our fault anyway. Right? You'll tell me more. Okay, so this is this is a matter of saving saving the ocean, or saving coral from an ocean which is deteriorating. Okay, am I right so far? Absolutely correct. Okay, all right. So um, I want to talk first about this this meeting in Waikiki, oh, in the convention center today and yesterday called I guess it's the Ocean Sciences Meeting. There are five thousand researchers there. There are one hundred and forty one panels. I saw that in the newspaper. It's <clears throat> very impressive. So is my telephone. And, <laughs> and I'd like to know more about it. You guys are there, right? In fact, yeah. Madeline, that's why you came to Honolulu this time, eh? Yes, that's the main reason I came to this meeting and to present our, uh, our work. And um, yeah, it's a very large meeting, as you indicated, and it consists of both biologists and, and physicists. So it's, it's, it's yeah, there's very divergent sessions. Um, and it covers um, everything from ocean acidification, uh, currents in the ocean, um, co the connectedness between populations of corals and other mar marine organisms, uh, microbiology, uh, what am I forgetting? Education. Um, education. Huge education pushes, outreach, trying to talk about how, why the oceans are so important to people and why we should protect them. Um, it's a, a, a massive gathering place for people throughout their career. So from you know, undergraduates all the way up to the most senior um, scientists, the lay public and the press. So it's an opportunity for, for the media to get an understanding of where the state of the art is in terms of ocean sciences. Extremely important meeting generally in sci the scientific community. Okay, let me get let me back up a minute. Can you introduce yourselves? Uh, first, Ruth, uh, you're a researcher mm -hmm. in ocean science at SOWEST, UH Manoa. Tell me about your training. Uh, tell me about uh, what you've been doing in your career. Certainly. I, um, so I'm a marine biologist, and I am at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology, which is that, that the research institute on um, on Coconut Island in the middle of Kaioi Bay, mm -hmm. and um, it's an ex extraordinary location to do research. My, my, my training, I did my undergraduate degree at the University of Newcastle upon Tyne in England. Um, I was uh, one of the Jacques Cousteau children, who, um, and I wanted to be a marine biologist from the age of 11, actually, and uh, everybody kept saying, but you're the wrong gender. You know, so I so I ignored that advice All of the completely. time, yeah, it exactly. might have been an argument. Exactly, no I more. just moved on. <laughs> I just moved on. So, um, and as I, my, my undergraduate was in marine biology, and I went on to do a PhD. Um, I was lucky enough to get awarded a, a scholarship to go and spend three years eventually in Jamaica and I did all of my research on the north coast of Jamaica on the coral reefs during a period of time when there was enormous change. Um, I was fascinated by corals and coral reefs but coral specifically because they are this super being. They, they're animals that have microcellular plants that live inside of them and that particular interaction is incredibly important to their basic biology and their function. In fact, if they lose these microcellular algae, a phenomenon known as coral bleaching, they die. That plankton? 
Uh, no, they're, they're actually tiny little round cysts that are inside the, the animal cells. I mean, it's, it's really very science fiction to think about having a plant living inside your cell. And that, that's what's so provocative about them, is mm. that they're seemingly so simple, they look like rocks, but, but they have this incredible complex biology within them. It's not just tiny plants, they have a lot of bacteria that they, they, they are constantly interacting with. And so they're, they're very sophisticated. So I, I, I study the reefs on the north shore of, of Jamaica and then was lucky enough again to get a, an offer of a position at UCLA and I spent actually 13 years at UCLA doing um, ever-changing trainings as, as after I got my PhD I worked in in, in a cell biology lab with um, a very senior coral reef researcher I retrained completely in molecular biology loved it did about two years in invasive um, species biology and then ended up with a last four year stint in comparative developmental genetics and was advised at that time that it's really time you got a real job and um, <laughs> one that was a more permanent job and the job at Coconut Island as a researcher in coral molecular biology came up, I applied for it and I've been here since 2003 um, and I have a very um, an active group of people that I work with who collectively our area of study is trying to really understand why some corals survive conditions that others do not. So I'm really interested in how varied the response of corals is to stress. You know, the party line is all corals will be dead by 2050 and yet there are clearly some corals that are doing quite well and the question is why? So we look at the various aspects of the biology of corals to try and understand that. And the concept that Madeline and I are, are working on and will be presenting at this meeting is really talking about if we can understand that well enough, can we then un leverage that understanding to breed corals that are, are better able to withstand future ocean conditions while we as humans take care of this bigger issue of reducing CO2 emissions. Working on two levels. Exactly. Oh, that's really exciting. Okay, I want to, just so many questions come to <laughs> mind. And I want to I hold my questions except for one. There was an article in the New York Times yesterday about Jamaica and other places in the yes. Caribbean, and it talked about how rum, you know, rum sort of originated in Jamaica. <laughs> and I wonder, while you were there, did you have anything to do with, with that? I, well, I didn't have anything to do with the origination, <laughs> but I certainly tasted my fair share. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> moving right along. <laughs> so, Madeline, how did how did you meet Ruth? That's a good question. How did we meet? <laughs> did we meet at that workshop in Mexico? First I, time? It's years ago. Now. Years ago. Years ago. Yeah. Yes. Long time ago, yeah. Yeah. ten years ago, roughly, perhaps. Oh, easily that. Or more. Yeah. Oh, yeah. this is a long-term collaboration. Yes. Well, yes. Tell, us, tell us how your training began. So I was also trained as a marine ecologist, and um, well, actually, when I did my un undergraduate training, I found it really hard to decide which uh, so, which part of biology I should specialize in because it's all so interesting. But in the end, I decided marine biology is what I wanted to do, so I studied marine ecology. And during my master's research, I, um, I did, a, did a, a research project and that involved genetics, which was a, an upcoming field because the PCR method had been developed. So it's a method that allows DNA to be amplified. And so we could actually work with DNA in a much more easy, easier way than before. PCR? Polymerase chain reaction, it stands oh, for. Polymerase, so, P yes. PCR. PCR, so it's yeah. a method that allows by an enzyme to, to make from a little bit of DNA, make a lot of DNA so we can work with it. So it, it revolutionized, the field of, uh, revolutionized the field of genetics. Mm -hmm. And I was fascinated by that, and I was fascinated by, um, the, 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 I, I saw how genetics could really help us understand complicated ecological questions. So I decided I wanted to do a, a PhD um, project that allowed me to learn more about um, genetic methods. And so I worked on um, cold water seaweeds for my PhD, trying to understand, um, this is all in the Netherlands, I'm from the Netherlands originally, mm -hmm. trying to understand um, how um, seaweed species that occur on, in the North and South Pole came to be where they are, because there are some species that are uh, populations of the same species that are closely related, and we didn't know whether that happened a long time ago, millions and millions of years ago, or recently maybe during the, the uh, latest um, um, ice ages. Mm -hmm. 
Now, following on from that, um, I, I felt I was uh, still a little bit weak in uh, in population genetics. So, to, um, using genetic methods to understand a more fine scale uh, processes, what happens within a population over short periods of time. So, I moved to England for two and a half years, and I did a, um, a postdoctoral research. Um, um, position on um, fishes that live in Lake Malawi in Africa. And these fishes are known to evolve extremely fast. You know, you can almost see them evolve within a, in a lifetime. And we try to understand... With genetic characteristics and all that. Yeah, so we, so I did the genetics and then I did, it was a collaboration. Other people looked at the behavior of these fishes and their morphology and their sex choice and so on. And, and yeah, so we, we, we try to understand what are the processes that drive this very fast evolution in these fishes in these lakes. And, um, but in the meantime, I had become very interested in coral reefs and particularly corals because corals, as Ruth um, explained so um, nicely before, are so, ni so complex. You know, it's, a, it's an animal uh, which lives closely associated with a single celled algae from which it derives most of its food. Al almost 90% of its food comes from the sun because the algae uses the sun to make sugar. S synergy. Symbiosis. Symbiotic, you call it. Symbiosis. Wow, exciting. Um, so um, I managed to get a, a position in Australia, um, in Townsville, which is in the northeast coast at James Cook University at the time. And I worked there uh, for about four years initially on the evolutionary um, history of, of corals, the coral animal, and following on from that on the symbiotic um, single-celled algae that, that lives inside the host cells. Um, and so got really interested in um, how corals adapt and cope with environmental stress. And um, then in 2001, I moved to the Australian Institute of Marine Science, where I am still today. And um, yeah, continue to work in that field. And I think I'll independently, Ruth and my um, uh, fields of interest have sort of converged and. Um, and we found each other, yeah, right? It's perfect. I mean, it's a perfect. <laughs> yes. yeah. It's a perfect. Um, it's a perfect collaboration because we're sort of at a similar stage. We we think in in different ways. So the sum of the parts is greater than the parts themselves. Uh, at least in, I have to say for myself. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you know, it, it's it, it is wonderful to have a collaborator who has a, a forward thinking. Um, perspective. You know, so much of our field is sort of looking and watching the the, the demise of reefs, and yes. I think that. You know, I think that, that we recognize that it's time to act, it's time to, time to think about solutions rather than just observing the changes and, and thinking about how to, to, to solve some of these larger level issues. Because we as scientists really cannot deal with a CO2 emission problem. Mm -hmm. But we do have tools in our tool set that will allow us to, to, to really develop some alternate strategies as we move forward. <coughs> Talia, this is fabulous. Thank you. So I want to know, you know, you guys, what motivates you? I mean, you're so dedicated. It's not just that you, you've looked at one side of the science. You have, you have evolved, the two of you. You have morphed, <laughs> the two of you. And then you've morphed together and you've worked together. Yeah. It's really extraordinary. What drives you? Well, I think it's, it, it's several things. One, and the... Uh, the desire to, to to contribute a little bit to this world and to society because You're not it's in it for the money. <laughs> <laughs> what money? <laughs> <laughs> no, but really, I think you know it. It if I think if I at the end of my career, if I can look back and can say I've contributed a little bit towards perhaps helping to save coral reefs, I'd be very very happy. And I think that is my main drive. The 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 realization maybe we can help a little bit rather than just, you know, basic science, of course, underlies all of this more applied science that we're doing. And it's really, really interesting. And in itself, it's very stimulating. But being able to to see your science science being taken up by society and, and being useful to, to help with the problem, I think that, that is very, that drives me at this moment in time. I, I, I agree with that 100%. And I think that, you know, a really important thing to emphasize is that our, where we are right now with 
thinking about how to develop this tool set is, is really building on these 25 years of basic science that we've been doing. So, you know, you, you, you do your science and you think, you know, you, you're not necessarily thinking of the sort of the why you're doing it. But what I think has been so great is all of the information that we've acquired over these years has sort of culminated in, in this place where we can propose something of, of, of the nature that we have. And, and we have some pretty um, strong feelings that, that what we've, we, we're suggesting we can do, we can do based on our, our basic knowledge of the system. Mm. I think the other thing for me that is, is I, I mean, I, corals are just fascinating organisms. And the complexity of biology, the discovery that you get every time you do something, you have an experiment that you think you're going to do. You sort of, in your head, we all think we're having an, where we think it's going to go, and it never goes there. And it's always something unexpected. You have to keep an open mind. That's right. You have to keep an open mind, and you have to let the data actually drive you. So it keeps you completely, you know. Oh, I, 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 you know. Obviously, I don't think I'm quite as clever as I thought I was because I don't have the answers. And that is a, is something that I love about my career. And I work with a lot of young people, and I'm, I'm training a lot of people who, who also have that fascination just for the discovery. The, the wow, this is something nobody else has ever seen before. And. If it can help, you know, it, it, it is, it is, that is such a bonus to be able to twist your science and say, I really want to make a difference. And at this stage, it's not really risky for us to do that because we both have fairly secure careers. And so we can step out with our, with our, our sort of almost like our, our scientific provenance and say these things and people will hear them, whereas somebody more junior perhaps wouldn't be heard. We're going to take a short break now. Because I have to throw my cell phone in a bucket of water. Nice. It'll only take a moment. <laughs> <laughs> must be an expensive habit. <laughs> <laughs> this is Think Tech Talks, the Solace Tower, the School of Ocean, Earth Science and Technology. We're talking about assisted evolution to help coral adaptation to ocean acidification. We're just beginning to get the outline of it now uh, with Ruth Gates and uh, her collaborator from Australia who is here in, in town for the Ocean Sciences meeting at the Convention Center, Madeline Van. Open. We'll be right back after this short break. Castle and Cook, Hawaii. Investing in Hawaii, creating communities, and providing for the needs of our state. Collateral Analytics. Empowering the real estate industry to make better informed property investment decisions. The Foreign Trade Zone. Bringing the benefits of the Foreign Trade Zone programs to Hawaii businesses and entrepreneurs. Galen Ho a senior executive of BAE Systems, a global defense, security, and aerospace company. Hawaiian Electric Company and its affiliates Maui Electric and Hawaii Electric Light Company on Hawaii Island. The Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, incorporating diverse perspectives to design a flexible and forward-looking energy strategy. Hawaii Energy, the state's energy and efficiency program created to help Hawaii's residents and businesses adopt a clean energy lifestyle. Hawaii Gas, helping Hawaii achieve its transition to clean energy and a better energy future. Hawaii Pacific Health, bringing technology and teamwork together to transform healthcare in Hawaii. The High Tech Development Corporation, attached to DBED, is the state's leading technology agency. The Scheidler Family Foundation, supporting educational, cultural, and charitable organizations, including Think Tech. Okay, we're back, we're live. Think Tech talks the SOWEST Hour, assisted evolution to help coral adaptation to ocean, ocean, ocean acidification with Ruth Gates and Madeline Van Oppen. And during the break, we were talking briefly about this sort of the, um, I guess it's the, the egotistical aspect, if any, of doing this kind of science. And your comment, please, Ruth? So, yeah, I, mean, I, I think that there are two sort of sets of scientists, people who are driven by sort of the personal, and all the reward system in academia is about you as an individual scientist. So how many publications you have, how many grants you're able to attract. And, and I think that, you know, it, it, there comes a point where you, you, you make a decision that, that it's not really you that's important. What's important is the mission, and the mission is to do the best science that you can to let the data actually drive your interpretation. And if you can make an impact and you can help with your science, then, then in my opinion, that's a responsibility. And that's a choice that we as individual scientists, I think, have to make, and one that I'm happy to sort of let my ego take 
go off to the back and let the science and the science agenda take center, center stage. And I think that's another reason why Madeline and I collaborate extremely effectively together, because we have that very similar approach to, to where we want to go. It's altruistic. Yes. Selfless. Yeah. In a yes. way. Yeah. And what strikes me is that part of it is part of it is in the nature of what you are doing. What you are doing, I mean, even just by the title of this episode, yes. what you are doing, you're not responsible for ocean acidification. Somebody else, maybe all of us in some mm -hmm. way, um, but you're trying to actually save, you know, save things from it. Yeah, and, we're, and try, we're trying to come up with, with one possible solution to, yeah. to deal with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's wonderful. So you can put your head on the pillow every night and think nice thoughts. <laughs> and I think it's really important to sort of, you know, r remember there is no one solution. There yeah. is, there are many ways that we need yeah. to be basically skinning this cat of solving the rapid degradation in the marine environment. And we have the biology, which is where we focus our efforts, is, is looking at what we can do to mitigate the impacts of these changes at, at the level of the reef. But then we have the context in which they live, which of course is driving those changes. And there's nothing that we're doing that is, is basically saying that, that changing the context, cleaning up the water quality, you know, changing the CO2 levels on the planet, we shouldn't forget about that while we're doing this. It's not. Yeah. It's not an either or thing. It's. It, it's a. We must get together and do everything. It's, I almost see it like a. You know, we have a big problem on the planet. There's a. There's a. There's a center to the spokes and there's a wheel around the outside. We are one of the spokes that is is coming towards a better planet in the center. But inherent in what you're both saying mm -hmm. is a, a kind of optimism. The optimism that science can help in this, mm -hmm. and that with your help, science will help in this and that we have a bad situation on our hands with the de deterioration of the planet. But science, thank goodness, science can actually help us. True. Are you optimistic? Uh, <laughs> Long answer. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a difficult one. I'm optimistic. I mean, some, some of our colleagues um, have, are much more pessimistic, and their vision is that, that we may not have coral reefs in, in 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. I don't think that it will happen. I think they will definitely change. Um, um, and I, th I think we, we already see that uh, corals are very plastic and able to adapt to some extent. For example, um, some, some reefs in the world we have seen over where well, more than one coral bleaching event has occurred over time, that the corals have become more resistant to, to that bleaching stress. So there is some evidence that corals themselves are responding and become, becoming more tolerant. And, well, those are the natural processes that we're hoping to harvest and, and help them um, respond a little bit faster so they can keep up, keep up a bit better. Okay. I'd also add that, you know, the message that everything is going to die it is it's not a message that, that will engage people. And, and I have to be frank in saying that I feel that, that we, we, we have oversimplified the issue. Madeline's pointed out there are many corals that are, are doing relatively well in conditions where we would not expect them to be doing well. It isn't to say that it's great, but there are some, some glimmers of hope. And the question yeah. is, why do we emphasize the negative message when there are glimmers of hope that perhaps are telling us something that is extremely important about how the system functions. Now, these are organisms that have been on the planet for millions and millions and millions of years. And so they're very entrepreneurial beasts. I mean, that's why they're so fascinating to study mm -hmm. because they do so many different types of things biologically. You know, if you think of a biological phenomena, corals invariably do it. So they're, they're a jack of all tra trades. Now, not all of them are a jack of all trades, but within the group, corals, some of them are, and it's probably those some that are going to be the ones that persist ah, through these very rapid the changes. The strong will prevail and help the exactly. weak. Exactly. But, you know, to be honest, there's nobody who's going to argue with the rates of declines on reefs are probably outpacing intrinsic capacity to adapt. That is evolutionary capacity. Okay, I want to get into the exact nature of your inquiry, but first yeah. one question. Why, why do we care about the reefs? Why? How will it, you know, you're talking about a sort of a, a long, we spoke of this earlier, mm -hmm. a long movie, a kind of disaster movie, mm -hmm. one of those, mm -hmm. you know, cataclysm mm -hmm. movies. Um, but why, how is this going to affect the human race? Well, this whole yeah. phenomenon, for better or worse. 
Well, coral reefs provide a, a range of very important services. And for, for one, they provide food to a lot of um, nations, and they provide protection, coastal protection, because if the reef disappears, um, the waves will just eat away the land, and so we will get massive erosion. Um, tourism in some countries, um, coral reefs are extremely important for tourism. So in terms of our economies and, and livelihoods, um, especially in, in the more um, underdeveloped uh, countries, the, life, the livelihood of man, many people depend on um, fish, fisheries um, on coral reefs. So they're extremely important um, across the world. I think, you know, one other thing, you know, sea level rise is occurring and we know that it's, it's occurring here in Hawaii, maintaining those effective boundaries and those effective boundaries around the island that really are platformed on the ability of corals to, to grow skeletons that create structures that break storms. It's going to be hugely important in terms of protecting the land masses behind. This coastal security piece cannot be emphasized strongly enough. I think, you know, the figure of 70% of the protein in Pacific islands it comes from the reef. To me, in the form of fish, that is just a huge number. Yeah. And when you really sort of start breaking that down, it, it, it affects every single person. So the deterioration of the reef has profound implications. If we lose the land protection, the land will be eroded. All of our coastal settings will be eroded. People whose houses are on the ocean, they will no longer have houses. This, is, this, it, this can happen in our lifetime. Do we know the full extent of the interdependency of the coral and the reef with the rest of the ecosystem? Or are there surprises out there we just don't know yet, the way it's connected? I don't know. Well, the, well, first of all, the corals provide uh, the three-dimensional structure of the reefs, and that provides the, the, the habitat, as we call it, the homes to a lot of other reef organisms, fish and crabs and worms. And so if that disappears and becomes like a flat landscape, then a lot of other animals and plants won't be able to live there. And so that whole balance, that equilibrium will fall apart and it's basically, it's, yeah, it's, it's a down, down, <laughs> downhill, down, down the hill spiral. So um, the, the corals are essential uh, organisms in, in the coral reef. I think some of the surprises um, that still exist or still exist to be discovered um, are probably related to the connections between not only the shallow reef and the land, but the shallow reef and the deep reef. Yes. And you know, technology is changing the way that we, we're doing science in general. But you know, remote vehicles and and the ability to access these very deep environments. There's been a lot of discussion that these deep reefs are potentially refuge environments. That means pr protected habitats for some of the shallow water species. That, so it's 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 not really, we don't really understand those connections very well we just know that they are connected and they, they likely play very very important roles and in both directions mm. it so might be sort of a contingent connection absolutely. a connection so it's under almost stress. a circularity <clears throat> and okay. you know sorry, sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to sort of frame this up so we have the, the delicate the delicate quality of the coral reefs yeah. we have the fact there are multiple kinds of coral out there we have the fact that uh, acidification is stressing coral uh, we have you guys with your multiple disciplines all coming together in your careers and you're really involved and committed in this. And my, my question now, at least for a few minutes, is so exactly, this is like a, the science fair. What is your hypothesis that you're working on? Uh, what kind of experiments are you doing? Uh, how confident are you that your hypothesis is correct? And when will you know? That's <laughs> great. Do you want me to start? <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> I'm speaking your science, your language of science. Yes, okay. so I'd say our main hypothesis would be that um, corals can be bred to have um, increased tolerance to environmental stresses, be it um, acidification and temperature, because those tend to go hand in hand with climate change. We see an increase in sea surface temperature as well as a a lowering in the pH, so an acidification of the water. So the hypothesis is that we, we, we are able to breed more tolerant um, corals. Um, what was the next question? The experiments. <laughs> so how are we going to do that? How so, we are going to do yeah, that? Yeah, test you, on this, yeah. Yeah, so um, do you want to? Sure. Do? I mean, I think that one of the things that I, just as we sort of prep for what we're thinking about here, if you think about humans, we have humans that are, are, are predisposed to have cancer in certain environments. That often is a genetic component. Um, 
we are exploring whether or not there are genetic, there's genetic information that is associated with either sensitivity or a, a vulnerability to stress. So um, there are also, um, if you're uh, somebody who doesn't exercise and you start exercising a lot, you might end up being able to run a marathon. And, um, but it took that experience, the, the, the exercise, to get you to a point where you could actually run that marathon. But once you've run a marathon once, you can often do it multiple times without actually having to go all the way back to start with the, with the experience. So there are corals, as Madeline mentioned, that have actually been exposed to a disturbance and, say, a temperature um, elevation and they've bleached, they've gone white, but they haven't died, which is, you know, a coral that goes white, essentially it's lost its, its, its unicellular algae inside itself, um, it's lost its food source, and there are two places it can go. It either dies or it recovers, and it, it regains its algae, and it goes on. But if it, hits, if it recovers and it hits another similar stress, often it will not bleach a second time. That means that that coral has a memory. It's had an experience that is, has made it better able to actually withstand. Like the marathoner. Exactly. Yes. So it hasn't, so, hasn't changed genetically, but still it has, it has changed. And that's probably due to some kind of epigenetic um, mark or some kind of response in the gene regulation. So this is actually genetic activity rather than changes in the genetic makeup. So this is the distinction between evolutionary time adaptation where you see changes in the actual structure of the DNA versus epigenetics or rapid adaptation. Yes, which even is within one generation. That's right. Exactly. Yes. That's yes. right. So you can see that the genetic code is a, is a book. The letters won't change, the words stay the same, but the way they are read can change. And that can change by, by experience, by environmental um, experiences. So did, really, you, did you have any idea that we would get into epigenetics here <laughs> in our discussion? I mean, this is really revelationary. <laughs> We're right up at the corner. I mean, I don't know much about it, but I know you guys are right up against the, the, uh, right. the envelope and now. What is even <clears throat> more interesting is that some of these epigenetic marks, those changes, can be passed on from one generation to the next. So they can then become heritable. And, and that is what we will test. Well, we'll, well, yes. we will. And so that's another area. We'll get into that as well. I yes. realize that experiment. epigenetics are also relevant to humans. Absolutely. Absolutely. So yes. what you do now, the, the lessons you learn could have import on the human level Absolutely. as yeah. well. Yeah. Because of course, let's not forget that humans evolved from corals. Little pieces so, with the little plants yeah, inside. Corals are much more sophisticated than we are. You know, we're much newer to the planet than they are. And so, you know, everybody ever says, well, we're the most sophisticated organisms on the planet. But all the genetic information that we have came from a coral. You have to think about it that yeah. way. You know, as a coral-centric person, I sort of disregard <laughs> all of the things up the tree. Corals well, yeah. share more genes for the human than with a worm. Yeah. That's really true. So it's <laughs> definitely relevant. <laughs> so it's definitely relevant. But there's a third area that we are exploring. So we're looking for sort of evidence of resilience in the genotype. So by doing a lot of genetic sequencing, we're doing experiments to give experience. And we're looking at how that experience translates through to, to the offspring. And the third area is, is one that both of us have spent a lot of time in our career looking at, which is the role of the symbiotic partners, the microorganisms that live with corals. What do they do? What we know is that now these unicellular algae are very, there's many different types of them. And depending on who you decide to partner with, you can be either better able to withstand a stress or less able to withstand a stress. And what we are interested in doing is starting to really think about how that symbiosis then can be looked at as a, a, a vehicle by which we might change the function of the coral itself to better face future stress environments. Now, oh, to give you an I'm idea of... I'm getting, my, yeah. I'm getting a, a major headache on this. Yeah. Is wonderful. So to give you an idea of how important this is and, and how similar corals are to humans. So there's, there's a, a huge emergence of the field of the, the human gut microbiome. That is all of the microbes that live inside your stomach, right? Yeah. That we now know that that those microbes and the composition of those microbial communities actually change the way we sleep, they change the way we digest food. Yeah. So it's a hugely emergent, the property of the host 
is actually it's it, you know the the whole it's you are yeah, what you so eat thing. It's the nature you are of what the you symbiosis. eat. <laughs> it is. And so I mean, you guys work with this. This is yeah. like a core part part of your yes. research. Yes. Yeah. But is it what is it? I mean, it goes way back, way back. Yeah. And it's the relationship of the parties to the symbiosis. But it's kind of a it's kind of an intelligence. It's, gonna, well, it's like they think together. It, what, what is it's, it? It's almost a mechanism, or is it more than a mechanism? Yeah. There, there has been co-evolution, obviously, but it also can be an acquired um, um, characteristic in a way because those, the microbial community that you associate with can change. And you know, one, if we take a course of antibiotics, we actually might end up feeling worse than we did before because all of our gut micro microbiota has been killed off, and it takes a while. For the good bacteria to grow again, yeah. and um, some people never recover from it and yeah, yeah. Uh, end up feeling feeling pretty unwell for the rest of their lives. Um, so yeah, it, it goes back a long time in, in evolutionary history. This this co-evolution of, of microbes and, and animals. Okay, so and how do you test on this? You go out and you you, you put a lot mm -hmm. of different coral animals in different tanks and. What do you do? You have to stress them with acidification, and what do you there's, do? There's a range of experiments, again. One is where we actually we can culture those single-cell algae. We can isolate them from the coral and culture them, and we can evolve them in the laboratory. So we can put them under ocean acidification stress and uh, evolve them, and then we can infect uh, little uh, young corals with these evolved um, algae, and then we can study um, how they tolerate stress. That is, how that do you is measure one. that? I mean, it's not like you can ask them. <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> we speak coral. <laughs> we speak coral, yes. But one thing we do is we... Um, you have to sing. <laughs> <laughs> Carl's like singing. I know. Like plants, you know. One thing is we look again at the, at the, the behavior of the genes in the coral, you know, the, the level of expression. So, so which genes are being switched on and switched off and so on is one way of measuring how they are doing. And that is other. We can, we can tell, by the way, they, the color, their color, you know, whether they maintain those single-celled algae or not. Um, so there's a range of ways we can measure that. So that's one of the things we're doing, um, and then the other one is more. We're field. doing a lot of the yeah, experimental work of, that yeah. you, you use, where we bring thing, we bring corals in. We we essentially expose them to um, to conditions that of the future. Stressful. Yes, and and. Or oh, you can create the conditions. Yes, we yeah. can. We so we're going to create an acidification absolutely. that is greater than what you find today. Exactly right. So absolutely. we can figure out what that'll be, and then you. Mm -hmm. you know, absolutely. Okay. So we can use predictions for what the what the future conditions will look like, and actually, the Australian Institute of Marine Science and Madeline will talk about this because it's so exciting. The facility that's being built in in Australia. Do you want to talk a bit about the sea sands? Yeah, we have just uh, late last year opened the National Sea Simulator as it's called. It's, it's a, a huge aquarium facility. It's located at the at the Australian Institute of Marine Science in Townsville and it was fun. Where is that? What city? It's in Townsville, a small town in, on the northeast coast of Australia okay. in Queensland. Okay, near the so, surfing, yeah. No, there's no surfing because we have a barrier reef, so we have no ways. We are well protected. <laughs> but so this facility was funded by our federal government, and it and it will be a national facility. So not just staff and students at Ames can use it, but national and hopefully international collaborators will come and use it as well. And so. It allows for um, large-scale, long-term experiments to be done, and also we call it for multifactorial experiments. So we can vary uh, a range of uh, parameters, so ocean acidification, temperature, sediments, pollution, all in the same experiment. So it's, it's, a, it's a fantastic facility that has just come so You can online, create so. this uh, artificial environment exactly. called so, a special stress environment. Yeah. Exactly, so we can compare um, today's environment with that, which is predicted to 10 years down the track, 50 years down the track, 100 years down the track, and, and, and study how the corals may respond. So have you been able to achieve the marathon man phenomenon? <laughs> I mean, where, where they get stronger in one generation, Within next time you stress them, they're better able to deal with it. Rosa, in her lab, you have done a little bit of. We have done a bit. Actually, we've done a bit of work where we've 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 essentially taken corals that are pregnant, and. We've ex pregnant. We've pregnant. You know, pregnant. this is because you know to, to to start to look at what we call transgenerational acclimatization. That is multi-generational. Um, we essentially take a coral. Corals are really extraordinary because they will reproduce on cue for a particular time of the year. So they will actually release their eggs and sperm 
the ones that spawn eggs and sperm or release them on a given night of the year at a given time of day. So, and it, it's really remarkable. And there's, there's, there's been a lot of, of, of television done on, on coral spawning events on the Great Barrier Reef particularly. Mm -hmm. but, but in Hawaii, we work with a, a, a coral that broods its, 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 its babies inside of its stomach. Essentially, just like us. So you see the analogies to humans just keep pouring out. <laughs> but anyway, so here's these these pregnant corals. We can bring them into the reef, into into our our aquarium facilities that are like the aquarium facilities that that Madeline described, but on a smaller scale. The sea simulator in Australia is on a, a mag magnificent scale. Ours is smaller, and we maintain our corals in the lab for shorter periods of time. So for a month, we can bring them in while they're brooding these their offspring, and then. When when their offspring emerge, you can actually take those offspring and, and, and expose them to the same conditions, these stressful conditions, and they seem to do fine. They seem to be doing much better. And that's really hopeful to me, that, that this, this, this system, the epigenetic mark, is actually being translated in some way to the next generation. And that, that advantage that's gained by pre-exposure then appears to be present in the first generation offspring of corals here in Hawaii. So that, that's pretty exciting. OK, it's time for me to thank Talia again. Thank you again, Talia. <laughs> Uh, Talia Oliari, Oliari, she's the uh, she's with the office of the vice chancellor for research at UH Manoa, and we are very appreciative for these fantastic guests that she has brought to us. Uh, Ruth Gates, uh, ocean science researcher here at uh, SOWEST, and Madeline Van Oppen, uh, her collaborator in um, um, Townsend. Townsville. Townsville. That's correct. Uh, near, near, um, near, near Cairns. Near, okay. People know Cairns usually. Cairns in, in Australia. Okay. <laughs> and we're talking Think Tech Talks, the Soest Hour, about assisted evolution to help uh, coral adaptation to ocean acidification. It's really important and it's really interesting. We'll be right back with some larger, larger implications of what they are doing. We'll be right back. I'm Hong Jiang, host for Asia In Review on Tuesdays. And I'm David Day, host for Asia In Review on Thursdays. Both of us broadcast our respective shows at 4 p.m. And my topics tend to deal with uh, questions related to environment, culture, history, and sometimes human rights. And my shows tend to be on international business, foreign policy, geopolitics, and national security. And you can watch our shows live on the ThinkTech website at thinktechhawaii.com. And uh, you can also watch us on YouTube or Olalo. So come join us on Thursdays at 4 p.m. I'm David Day. And oh. on Tuesdays at 4 p.m., I'm Hong Jiang. Aloha. Aloha. Okay. okay, we're back. We're live. We're with Ruth Gates and Madeline Van Oppen, collaborators in assisted evolution to help coral adaptation to ocean acidification. One of the most interesting shows I can remember. I really appreciate you guys coming <laughs> Thank down. Thank you. So uh, we, we only have about uh, eight minutes left, and I want to see if we can make large with this. Um, you guys are dedicated to it, and you're making interesting, interesting strides that, that relate to the coral, but also to the world. I mean, the scientific world, the natural world, things we didn't really know before, am I right? Yeah. yeah. This epigenet epi epigenetics thing is just remark remarkable in every context. So. <clears throat> Why should people care about your work? Um, why should other sciences care about your work? Why should Dave Carl care about your work? Uh, does he? Is he involved? Yes, he does. He, I mean, Dave, I think. Dave Carl is a what, Academy of yes. Science. Marine, marine biology researcher here. At he is. He's a microbial ecologist and, and an extremely effective one. And um, I think that you know I'd like to just take one step back and, and just give you a, an idea of this. This 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 idea started in a discussion that we had. The sort of the idea of taking it to this next level of trying to have an applied solution of bringing, you know, of thinking about breeding corals that would be able to withstand future conditions was really because I think as scientists we see the discussion. We see almost this, this it, it, it's happening, things are happening so fast on our planet, technology is moving so fast, we're not moving fast enough to mitigate the really big problems like the, the, the global CO2 problem. And, and there is a need to, to, to change the way that we do business and the way that we take science into a much more <laughs> applied framework and one that leverages the very edge of knowledge. 
Um, and I think that at the same time as we were having this discussion, Paul Allen, who is co-founder of Microsoft, put out this Ocean Challenge. So he put out a, a, a challenge to the ocean community saying, we're looking for the best ideas to mitigate the impacts of ocean acidification. Send them to us and we'll give you $10,000 if you win. Um, and we won the prize for. Oh, very the, and, nice. Very yes, nice. and this is and this is actually why we we'll be presenting the concept of the meeting as part of the award for the prize. But the bigger prize was to be able to submit a proposal to the Paul Allen Foundation to actually push the project in its entirety forward, which is currently in review with that with that um, philanthropic organisation. And I think that what 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 is happening around this is there's 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 people in the lay community saying we need to do something we need to we have we have capacity to bring to the problems and you know obviously the philanthropy community has capacity to bring to these problems because the type of work that we're talking about is somewhat high risk and why well i think because it's a little bit scary and you know, one of the issues that i think has has been brought out is sort of the idea is is this gmo is this what you're doing with coral well, the answer is no, that's not what we're doing. But what that, that, that question really reflects is people's fear of engineering natural systems, the fear that they have that we might do something that could potentially be detrimental. Because let's face it, we've tried to engineer before and things have go, gone wrong. You know, there are issues with, with pesticide use here in Hawaii associated with GMO. That's not what we're doing. So I understand that level of sensitivity. And you know, our goal is to be completely transparent about what it is that we're doing and what we hope the gains will be. But I would also ask, what's the risk of doing nothing at this point? With these rapid declines, in 10 years time, we may say, oh, it's time to act, to do something like we're proposing right now, but we won't have any brood stock to start to work with. We won't have any corals left to really have, that have any, any resilience. So I feel like it's a timely issue. It's a slight sort of shift in the way that we do business as scientists. It's like a race against yes, time. Yes, because we is. see the urgency mm -hmm. and I think all, you can't be a 20, you know, I've been a coral reef biologist for 30 years. You cannot be seeing the reefs change and not have this gut feeling of like, oh no, we've got to do something. And we've got to do it fast. Because, you know, five years ago, we didn't think we'd be sequencing individual human genomes. But we are. Uh, we have so much capacity coming to the table for science. We have so much ability to do things in a way and in a, in a, in a scale that's never been done before. So in some ways, this is absolutely the perfect time to think about how to adapt some of the things that we really we take for granted. So things like um, you know, breeding of livestock. Essentially what we're doing is exactly what we've done with livestock to produce large amounts of food for people. Sure. You know, that's what we're doing. Sure. Yeah. It's quite interesting also that over the last few years while Ruth and I have been developing these ideas that initially there was a lot of skepticism. You know, people would say, our colleagues would say, oh, you know, what you propose, it's not feasible for corals because the generation times are too long or you can never do it for all corals, it's not feasible, you know, it won't work. And But now there's a, we, we, we see a shift and there's more and more people saying, Maybe it's not so crazy. It's not such a crazy idea, and, and then people realize that um, the coral reefs are continuing to decline, and something needs to be done, and we need to look at all possible solutions. And so I think there's a bit more acceptance now starting to happen of of the ideas that we are putting forward, which is is quite encouraging. Because it's unique. I mean, is your collaboration unique, or other other collaborations? Is the you know, UH, Manoa, and uh, town, Townsville. Yeah, <laughs> Townsville, <laughs> Ames. <laughs> yeah. Um, is, it, is, it, uh, is it out there in the front, or do you have competition, or other collaborators who are in, in the same you space? You mean in the field of assisted yes, evolution? Yes, yes, yes. I am not aware of anybody else um, d wanting to do the same thing uh, we are proposing. I, I'm not aware either, but I have to say, if we find somebody, we'll be going to them and saying, let's put all of our minds together. Sure. Absolutely. So that's yeah. the goal, yeah. is to bring a group of people together. It's not a competitive interaction. Our agenda is to develop capacity that can make a difference on reefs. And, and we will engage with anybody who has that same agenda. It's not about us or getting there first. It's about the reefs. So last question, where is this going to go? In your mind's eye, you must, you're scientists, you must see ahead. 
It's part of scientific thinking, isn't it? So where do you see this going? And not only on you know in, in your own notes and your own data, but in terms of its effect on things in general. I would say um, that's sort of short term, medium term, and long term. So short term, I say five years. We would need. Um, for some proof of concept to figure out which which of the approaches that we will test uh, are the most useful, and and then um, and and then we have to come up with a plan. How could we possibly implement um, some of these um, approaches in in the field? Um, so we need to. That means regrow the coral, re re revitalize the coral. Exactly right. Um, and so and that involves, of course. Um, um, Coral reef managers, um, the general public, um, scientists, you know, a wide group of uh, people we need to, to, to initiate a, a debate and we need to um, try and get acceptance of these ideas and of course do it in a very safe way and controlled way initially. Clearly you have to come back and talk some more about it. <laughs> to affect as many people as we can. Mm. <laughs> it's, it's really, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's one thing to do the proof of concept and to do the, we can generate the bio, biological capacity. It's a quite different thing to actually use the biological capacity. And mm. what we're saying right now is let's do the development of the biological capacity in parallel with the reaching out to the multi-stakeholder community so that by the time we have it we are poised to do some demonstration projects and um, the demonstration projects we would probably attempt to do initially would be to restore a heavily damaged reef yeah. that really is depauperate. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we're not talking about going into a reef and, and you know, into, into face it or interleaving little little corals that are better, but we're talking about let's do something on a reef that's already damaged. The, the second area we've, we, 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 we feel is going to be a very important one is there's a lot of concrete being poured into the ocean at this time to harden coastlines. and. Concrete is non-sustainable in the water, and and often it does not serve any kind of a, a a sink for CO2. And so one of the things we're talking about is can we create green veneers that we can essentially plant corals on these structures to both accrete calcium carbonate, so making the structure themselves more sustainable, and also allowing that structure now to be a living, breathing thing that, that draws down CO2. So it's a CO2 sink, just like a live reef is. So that is one thing that I think most people don't recognize, is that living coral reefs absorb CO2. So they are buffering at some level. Um, so, you know, it's plants are critical to the planet and how we, how CO2 is being regulated on the planet. And corals are essentially plants because they depend on this microcellular algae. For this discussion, I'll call them a plant. Of course, they are animals. But, but you know, it's that. So, but in 50 years' time, would we be using these? Would we have large stocks of these, these manipulated organisms? Yes, I think we would have large. Would it be an industry? Yes, I think it might be. <clears throat> You're saving lives in a way, and you're creating new life in a way. Yes, and the ultimate goal is to sustain the services that reefs provide for humans. Yeah, yeah. It's, to, it's to service our agenda, really, because that's, it's a monetary issue. It's a huge economic, and it's important to the well-being of all humans. Thank you, Ruth Gates. That's it. We've got to leave it there. And Madeline Van Oppen, thank you very much, ladies. It's been a wonderful discussion. Think Tech Talks, the Soest Hour, uh, assisting evolution to help control to coral adaptation to ocean acidification. Great discussion. Uh, we'll be back shortly with Kali'i Akina, a e Hanakako. Thank you so much again. Aloha. Thank you very Thank much, you. Jay. Thank you.